All right, hi everybody. This is Dave Vellante from Wikibon.org, and I'm here with John Furrier and Rebecca Thompson of Avir, um, which is a very interesting startup. We met you guys almost a year and a half ago. Maybe, right, a year and, and a half. Uh, two years ago, and I noticed you had a big announcement. Uh, get nice and close so the audience can hear these microphones shield out all the Great. background noise. No problem. And, um, and you, you, you've been doing some really interesting things and really dramatically different um, innovation around tiering, which is sort of what we first heard, and Ron gave us this incredible presentation. Um, looking, it was struck me as he looked back on history and said, "Look at what what densities have done, and look at what the performance has done. This is a huge problem. You guys have incredible secret sauce about matching the right data and the device characteristics, but now you've extended that um, pretty substantially, um, and you've es essentially got the way David Flory described to me is Avir's got what NetApp should have. Um, that's how we described it. Okay. That's and so, good. and I said, wow, that's kind of cool. I get it. Because I saw your announcement and I said, okay, it's, it's got this and this is the price. I said, all right, what am I, what am I getting? So why don't you talk a little bit about, let's start, for those who no, don't know Avir, tell us about the company, um, sort of the innovations that you have, where you're at, and we'll have at it. Okay, great. So Avir was founded in, we're, first of all, we're based in, uh, we're a little unusual in that we're based in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and um, not many high-tech companies there, but there happens to be a large contingent of people with Carnegie file Mellon. systems expertise coming out of Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, right. And so the co-founders of Avir um, have a long history in file system development and data storage. And um, the uh, uh, most of the founding team had been the founding team of Spinnaker Networks, which was a clustered file system. Um, one of the very first clustered file systems out there that was acquired by NetApp. So they all hung around NetApp for a few years, and um, you know, once they, I think, feel like they had, you know, met their obligation to NetApp, came up with an idea to say, what other, you know, what other storage problems are there out there that aren't being solved? And one of the things they came upon was the fact that, you know, people were using spindles to improve performance. And while disk drives were getting denser and denser and denser, they weren't getting faster. And so it was taking, you know, so in, uh, the more data you have stored, the longer the seek times and so on and so forth. And people were doing crazy things to get performance. So they were short stroking, um, you know, and going to larger and larger um, filers in order to, to, serve up, to serve up that I.O. And they said, this is just madness. Just right? throwing hardware at the problem. Yeah, just throwing just, hardware yeah. at the problem. And they said, this is madness. There's got to be a better way. And particularly when you think about now um, with all the, you know, sort of newer solid state storage media on the market, how can you take advantage of that? So, and disks do, do some things really well. If you want sequential access to data, they do it really well and really efficiently and very inexpensively. But Flash does some things um, in solid state, both RAM as well as Flash you know, does other things very well. So that's when they came up with the idea of, wouldn't it be great if we could come up with some algorithms that would allow us to tier data, to take you know, things like uh, how frequently is it accessed, what type of file is it, um, how are people reading it, um, you know, is it random or sequential, and go ahead and on the fly, in real time, Time, um, put that on the right storage media. And in essence, what, what Avira does, what our appliances do, is they offload the I.O. Um, from those filers. So no longer are you relying on your NetApp or your Isilon to do the work of serving up the I.O. to clients. Your, um, our performance nodes are doing that. And so now, you don't have to do the crazy things um, in the back end that you were before. You don't have to short stroke drives. You don't have to keep adding shelves of you know, um, you know, energy consuming fiber channel. You can just you know, use, um, put our nodes in, which are, have a very small footprint, much less expensive, and and you know uh, the intelligence in our system is going to put the data in the right place. And we're promoting and demoting back and forth, you know, from that back end storage. So you're basically taking all these choke points, all these bottlenecks, and then bringing them in and managing them more intelligently so that they don't have to be managed with a system that's really not designed to manage them? That's right. I mean, because essentially these, you know, these sort of large large storage servers, large filers, um, had been created to, to do both things, to serve both masters. They were trying to scale performance and trying to scale capacity. And they were you know, serving neither master well. And so, but by, by having a, you know, per, by having performance nodes between the client and those filers and just really taking care of serving up I.O., now you've offloaded those, you know, so you can get, a, you know, a longer lifespan out of what you've already invested in. And, and, you know, and there's some great data management functionality on those devices, things like your backup routines and snapshots and, you know, all those sorts of things, which, you know, is great. So yeah. now they can do their job well. Um, we do the, you know, we do the job of serving up, and we do the job of serving up I.O. really well. So the use case is front-ending, 
some smaller filers. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, or even front ending. I mean, there, we front end smaller file, filers. We even uh, larger filers. We even front end <laughs> larger filers. Yeah. It depends on the application. But you know, um, you know, what we tell people is we'll sit in front, and then instead of going out and buying new fiber channel drives for that filer, put SATA drives in there. You know, make the make those drives in there. Um, you know, put as much capacity as you want. Make it really dense. Dedupe it even if you know. Put dedupe on there if you want, because we're going to take care of you know serving up accesses to the client. So, so that's what you know. So um, that was sort of the, the initial, um, you know, uh, benefit promise to the customer who we went out there. But now it's a year and a half later, and we've done some we've done some interesting things. You know, um, interesting enhancements uh, to the software that um, you know bring even more benefit. So, like what? what I mean, is so with our 2.0 announcement, uh, we just announced last month the 2.0 version of our operating system, which runs across all of the um, you know all of the uh, appliances, with the ability to create a global namespace. So what happened was customers yep. said to us, hey, Avira, you're in a perfect spot. You're sitting between us and those backend filers. But you know what? We've got multiple vendors back there. I've got NetApp. I've got Isilon. I've got some Sun stuff. And it's hard to manage. It's, it's, it's painful. And I have to manage each one, of these, each one of these things separately. And when I move data around, um, it causes problems on the client. The clients have to reboot. We take downtime. Um, and it would be nice if I could manage this all as sort of a logical storage pool. And so we've given them the ability to do that. We confront you know, up to 24 um, you know, various filers from a multitude of different vendors, um, both in the data center as well as things people have in remote locations over the wide area, and create one logical namespace for them. They don't give up their physical view either. That's always there. Um, so you know, our system and, and so the administrator always knows where things actually are, but they can go ahead and group things together. So how do you guys quantify value for your clients and prospects? I mean, you're not buying capacity in your system, but you're, you, by putting in the Avere system, you have capacity and utilization impacts. I can use higher capacity drives. So, so let's talk a little bit about the ROI, if yeah. you will. Because when you, when, you, when you read the press release, you say, okay, I got a three terabytes, and it was cost me $70,000. You go, oh, wait a minute. But, but, but people shouldn't think of it that way, should they? Right. Right? No, they they got to look at the whole system, and the global namespace has an impact on there. Right. So talk a little bit about, I mean, do you get that from clients? Talk about how you walk them through the ROI so that their CFO doesn't go, what? You know, I can right. get that from, you know, EMC for way less. Right, right. Well, I mean, we, you know, we talked to them about, so for example, by offloading the performance requirements from those filers and you know filling them full of SATA drives, it's a tremendous reduction in the footprint. So what would take you five times the amount of disks now takes one time. So think about your the colo space, your rack space, um, the power, um, and that's just and that's a that's a savings you get immediately when when you put us in place. But then long term, as you're scaling out, as you're scaling out the infrastructure going forward, you're no longer having to buy buy the highest end, highest performance filer. You know, you're buying some kind of mid range thing because you're not really looking at it for its performance. You're looking at it for its capacity. Now, now your early customers, I presume, get this right away, and they're not having to go through some hardcore justification. Or maybe they are. I'm sort of interested in that. But as you widen out and, and expand your marketplace, you're probably going to have to. But talk about some of the early successes. Can you name some customers? Or? Sure, sure. We have um, we have a couple of customers that I can talk about. One of the interesting ones is uh, Sony Imageworks. So Sony Imageworks, they're a you know media and entertainment company based in headquartered in Culver City, California, and they originally came to us and they do their primary application is video rendering, and they and so of course they're very very concerned about performance and also very concerned about cost. They want to be able to do video renders and do them fast, but you know have some reasonable um, you know reasonable cost uh, metric for them. So they came to us and said we'd like you know to try out a couple of your nodes and see if you can help us you know in, um, improve the speed of our rendering. So we did that. We sent them a couple of nodes and they're like, wow, this stuff really works. Then they said, you know what, Avira, we have a group of remote animators uh, located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, and they had need access to the same files that are on our, you know, on our filers here in Culver City, but that latency over that, you know, and it's the you know, it's a private link, but the latency, the round trips um, are so bad that the animators get so frustrated that they're actually taking and downloading stuff and putting it on flash drives. These are movies that aren't yet out in the public market mm -hmm. running around on flash drives. Um, so there's a lot of concern about that. So what Sony did is they said, hey, Avir, could, can we take um, a couple of your nodes, send them out to Albuquerque, you can hold all of that, you know, um, active data, serve that up locally, and then um, write it back, you know, um, you know, on some sort of delayed fashion to the filer in Culver City, and that's what happened. And it was phenomenal. I mean, the users out there were like, oh my gosh, they you know, were finally first class citizens. They thought that what Sony had done was had bought them their own storage server and put it out there, when in, in actuality, it was a veer. So listen, I have that's to run nice. to this panel. 
Okay. Um, and uh, so maybe you can keep talking to Rebecca. Um, Ron's here as well. And Ron is here? Yeah, he Oh, Ron is good. Like, super alpha geek, can take you through a bunch of interesting Great. stuff and get his opinion on some other things that he's seen at the show. But uh, Avir Systems uh, was a, was a uh, Wikibon CTO uh, award finalist. Yep. Uh, David Floyer awarded that. Um, really interesting startup. Uh, so I got to run. Rebecca, thanks very much for coming on the cube. We'll okay, see you thanks. around. Okay. See you around. Good to see you again, John. Right. Thank you. Right. Yep, see Ron. Just wave him over here. Where where did he go? Uh, Ron, the CEO, award winner. That's great. Of uh, the CTO, is he a CTO? He's a CEO. CEO. Okay. CEO. What did he win? The Wikibon CTO, the CTO award. Yeah, he could be a CTO. He's technical. Where is he? Oh, yeah, there he is. Okay, so while we're waiting. It's got to, we got a mint. Okay, Ron, the CEO of Avir. 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 What did Stu call it? Averi. <laughs> He's challenged. And Ron, I already talked about Sony. Oh, oh anyway. talked about Sony. Okay, good. Ron, John Furrier, founder of Silicon Angle. Nice this to meet you. Cube as my product. Uh, Dave had to step away for a panel, no but problem. apparently you won an award for Wikibon. You did. Oh yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry. Congratulations. You said you're alpha geek. Yes. That's what Dave says, which means you're technical. Great. Uh, Ricky, we good with the cameras? How are we doing? Good. Okay. So um, Rebecca and, and I, well, Dave, we're talking. I was just listening. I'm uh, talking about the startup. And are you like technically a startup, or are you a more growing company? Because Startup means different things. Are you guys early stage startup, Series A, B? You funded. So we're a startup. We've we we're funded. We've done a Series A and a Series B. Okay, good. And um, so we're well funded, but you know we're still small. We're in the order of 50 employees, and um, it, life is just exciting. Yeah, yeah. It's all about customer acquisition. Everyone still acts as a team. Yeah. It's the fun part of what being in a startup is. Cool. So I love startups. Well, that's all I do since '97. But. Uh, Startups are exciting, and it's good the show here has a lot of startups, and we've talked to four funded companies, a lot of growth in the storage area, uh, even uh, you know, David Scott from HP just did a flyby and talked about um, his view in the market, he just gave a talk up there about how explosive the growth is in this new environment. You know, talking about you know remote workers in Albuquerque um, working on some stuff, and you know, it's just, it's just going to get more and more clustered, if you will, around users touching the network. Customers, employees, consumers, you know, there's going to be more and more Facebook like applications out there. And so the conversation we've been having about is what's the impact of the startup community? And you guys look like an innovation there, so that's exciting. Question for you who's backing you? Which VCs? Any Silicon Valley VCs? Are they? Um, Silicon Valley. So our Series A was co led by Menlo Ventures and Norwest Venture Partners, and our Series B was led by Tanaya Capital. Tonight Capital. Who from Norwest was on the... Uh, Norwest is Matt, Matt Howard. Howard. Matt Howard, okay. And um, Menlo is John Jarvey, and okay. Tanai is Brian Paul. All right. Yeah. Brian, Brian Paul's actually based in Boston, but right. Tanai is based in California. Yeah, I know Menlo. And they're, they're not the... Uh, those aren't the hyped up firms, but they're very steady, solid, solid, good people at those, very at those firms. Very strong funds. So the, and, and obviously Norwest got billions, and, you know, on, on, I, know I know those guys well. The Menlo, so the short answer, though, those. about those guys is... Um, Menlo and Norwest co-led my A round at Spinnaker, and um, so they it was my same board members actually at Spinnaker Networks. We're putting the band back together. We're putting the band know, back John together. John Belushi said, right? And you know, yeah. I had such a good time working with those guys, and yeah. absolutely pillars in the community, and really understood yeah. the startup environment. Yeah. It was a great experience for us. We, Dave and I were just talking with Steve Kennison from IBM, who's a startup guy too, who sold his last company to Storewise to IBM. And talking about, you know, he was asking, because I live in Silicon Valley, and um, we're talking about, you know, what's entrepreneurial path? I'm like, because we're talking about NetApp, and I'm like, you know, if, if you've been with a VC, you've done business with them, and they've made money, you've made money for them, pretty much will give you a, a good look over, if not put the same team in place. So um, that's pretty much how it's done. So congratulations. Plus, if you know them, it's about yeah. the partnership, right? Sure. That's right. You want board members that are going to be value add, not value subtract. So Spinnaker was a great outcome in the end, right? Selling to network appliance for over 300 million. Big deal. But it wasn't always smooth. There were definitely ups and downs. And we kind of restructured the company. In what the year did they sell that? In, in, Holy cow, I gotta get the year right. So it was, it was about eight years ago, 03 we sold. Okay, so post bubble. 
That's right. So the stock actually was lower. Right. So they had that huge plum plummet. That's right. Right. They had 130 right. something. Mm-hmm. Right. And the, that's and right. The, you know, they were hit heavily by the by the bubble. But I mean, the the what I loved about Menlo and Norwest, particularly John and Matt, is that they were with us at Spinnaker, and we had definitely some moments where we had to change the company, retarget ourselves, retool, change the product. And, you know, it wasn't always roses at the board meeting, but I knew how those guys acted under pressure. I knew how they acted with us. And A lot of times was, VCs will cave under pressure. That's right. And I love these guys. They were perfect. I loved working with them, and I was eager to work Who with them. Who are the partners again? again? Get them on the record here. John Jarvey at Menlo Ventures and Matt Howard at Norwest. Great testimonial. You don't always hear great stories about VCs. <laughs> um, a lot of them are really poor, and but there are good VCs. As I write about in my blog post, people know, you know, I'm pretty uh, anti-VC if you don't know them or yeah. like them. But you know, I'm pro-VC if you get a good VC. They have money. They are institutional investors, and that's a great example of a success story. So, uh, and then there are good firms in there. But and a lot the best of bad testimonial firms. I could give for them is we only present it to them for Series A. We worked with them in the past. Why would you go anywhere else? Exactly. I mean, it's a known, known quantity. Exactly. So let's talk about your company now. So it's startup. It's exciting. You're, you're, you're changing the game. X NetApp. So you guys kind of bolt out of NetApp. Um, you did your time. Um, and NetApp's doing great. They're a growing company. Um, I kind of give them some, some hell here and there, calling them a niche storage vendor. Um, and NetApp a niche. Great. Yeah. <laughs> what are we? <laughs> I was, startup. I was kind of yeah, goofing on NetApp last night. You guys are a niche player. I hate that. Yeah, it's like... Compared to EMC, you know, so so, but they're not. They're a big company. They're doing right. well financially. Uh, great, great CEO. Great company, absolutely. Yeah, they got great entrepreneurial DNA in there, and they even do. as a big company, they're still entrepreneurial, which is one of their their hallmarks. But you guys are true entrepreneurs. So, you, you're targeting this market. What is the big sweet spot for you? The big mega trend. Um, Rebecca was talking a little bit about how the, on how the tech works, but what's the big trend that's driving your uh, product and value proposition? Right. So NAS servers today or one um, monolithic server. And that one monolithic thing has to do everything. It has to point towards the clients and provide the client experience, and it has to do all the data management. And what we decided when we started Avere was, it really is two separate functions. Providing the scalable performance, providing you know the, the client-facing side of NAS is very different from doing the data management. And honestly, Network Appliance does, is, has one of the best data management stacks of any vendor. So we love NetApp, we love what they do on the data management side. But what we decided to do was come up with an architecture that let us work with them, let us work with any NAS vendor, yet pr- provide the scalable client-facing side of NAS. So as the data explosion hits and storage is changing, we were talking about that earlier about the changing face of storage industry, you guys are really interested in a new kind of element to address the performance versus capacity exactly. issue, which is, you know, one big god box does it all. Right. Horsepower, you know, tweaked up. I mean, that's an isolon like solution, right? right? So, uh, and when you have the trends are more like a Hadoop, where people that's are right. looking at, you know, scaling out in a different way, yeah. unstructured data. That's so you right. you have a diversity issue. So talk about that dynamic, in particular, and and because uh, that's something that a lot of people don't unpack. You know, I just want a solution. Is it performance capacity? It doesn't matter. When is a god box, big fat box, worth it? And when is it? Right. And so, isn't it worth it? So the, honestly, the, the, the places where we do the best is people come to us and say, I have a problem that I need high performance on this application. Or if I have a problem that I need to deal with multiple sites remote and there's high latency to where my data center is, these are the client-facing side questions that we'd like to solve. You know, where the data is managed, where it's stored, the density, you know, what the cost per gig is for the ultimate storage is something that we don't want to deal with. And so we enable, we think we enable a lot of this new style of use of storage, distributed collaboration, right? Being able Plus to you're a startup, you're like, I don't want to build that product, it's too expensive. Right. It's been done right. before, right. it's right. like, you know, right. it's a lot of cost. Well, what's interesting is, I mean, storage is sort of a laggard in, in going towards the distributed model. Every other type of technology has gone from monolithic god box type things, right? right. You know, one, one massive processor yeah. and, you yeah. know, one massive server to distributed architecture and, and but you're right I mean I think you're exactly right they are lagging and but that's here now right I mean right. we're seeing you know the Hadoop movement for example with Cloudera and these folks on the on the and open source side to you know EMC with Isilon trying to get back in that big data with you know and HP buying Vertica 
So you're seeing analytics is a very important real-time information. So you're just seeing kind of a changing paradigm. Uh, and, and I just don't see a lot of proof points around the uptake of this distributed storage. So I'm trying to flesh out, you know, that's the use case, that's the killer use case. Is there is there a killer use case? So so the it's interesting on the data management side, I'm not I don't know what the right architecture is on the data management side. And honestly the the one large box which which does all the data management is a great model because you can coordinate snapshots. You can guarantee consistency across all directories, across all files. And so I think I think the people in the management piece need to really focus on that. On ours, the killer app very clearly is scalable performance. I need to run Oracle. I need to run VMware. And I need to just let that usage performance scale as I add employees, I add users. And we allow that. It just scales linearly. So, and you do with multi-vendor. That's right. I no mean, matter I, where you... That's the number one message we're hearing is, and not that people are anti-Oracle, we've we're been critical of Oracle because we're more like a watchdog uh, agency on Oracle because you know they tend to try to land grab and lock people in. Uh, but people are, are, are clearly voting with their pocketbook by saying, hey Oracle, we'll run you, but you're running an app and you're running on our, our core business, but we got to do other stuff. Right. So does that, is that what you're saying, that you guys can fit into that? Yeah, so industry standard protocols, I think that's the most important thing. So we do NFS and SIFs to the clients, so any app that can run on NFS and SIFs, we can speed up, we can enhance the performance, we can run distributedly. And, and when we talk to the management boxes, again, industry standard protocols, it's NFS. If you give us an NFS mount point from any device, we can make sure the data lands there eventually for you to do your management on. Okay, so where are you guys at in terms of uptake of the product? So you got some funding, what was the uh, amounts? Series um, A and B total? Series A was 15 million, Series B was 17. I think VCs love to write those big checks because Norwest's got billions to get rid of. <laughs> um, and so you guys are look like a good bet. So you got your fund and you have customers, so you have yeah. clients. Is it growth good on the cash flow side and client uptake good? It's doing well. Um, you know, we've got lots of customers in several different verticals now. I think our early verticals with media and entertainment, oil and gas, um, genomics, the normal big pain, suspects. big data. Yeah. But the, the exciting thing to me is when I look across the customer base, we're growing outside of that very quickly. Um, standard enterprise apps, you know, like all VMware the databases. VMware is really a huge one. Virtualization VMware. probably just, oh, so you love, love virtualization, do. don't you? Yes, we do. We do. I mean, that's changing the storage industry all by itself. You, there's lots of cost yeah. savings in a virtualized um, model of deploying apps. Virtualized deployment is wonderful. You need that logical control because you're running basically logical machines. That's right? right. What comes along with that though is a very high infrastructure cost. There's lots of I.O. There's lots of processing to run those virtualized environments. Yeah. And we can provide the I.O. piece of it. And it really makes, it takes virtualization to a much higher performance level than what could you get before. We we're just talking about one of our customers that has actually taken moved everything from raw metal to virtualization and actually got a performance increase when they did it because we put a lot of the accesses in solid state um, instead of going to spindles that and were We were just talking about the solid state and just the footprint costs alone are, are compelling. That's right. I mean, just there. So, so let's talk about the, um, the, um, the company. Okay, so you have a roadmap, you're in the market, you have this new positioning, um, are the things that surprise you? I mean, you guys come from Spinnaker, so you know you, everyone has their own DNA. You kind of have the, your normal habits. You're in storage, right. you're in Pittsburgh, which is cool, and you're Carnegie Mellon. You know, kind of blue collar. You know, get it done. Right. You know, rock and roll. Just it's, Go it's dirty business, a storage Steelers. business. Steelers. You know, Steelers it's like you know, right? I'm a Patriots fan, so uh, AFC <laughs> foe. But you know, it, it, storage is you know, it's nuts and bolts. I mean, it's it's hardcore it's tech, right. right? So it's some science involved. Um, around software, and you got physical media to deal with. Um, what surprised you? Um, from the time of inception, so you see the, the opportunity. Where, where you are now, what's the biggest surprise, uh, if any, like that you've had from the Great. market? So, so we, when, we, when we started the company, we identified three targets. It was scalable performance, efficiency, doing more with less. So moving to SATA, lower cost spindles, and get the same performance. And the third is WAN, cloud, doing things remotely. The thing that really surprised me is our last release, the global namespace release. We had an upswell of customers. Once they saw the architecture, there was client machines, there was our systems, and then there was the mass server. Once they said, I don't know, you guys are in the middle, you could help me. 
I've got all this NAS clutter. I've got like eight filers. So they're cleaning house. Vendors. <laughs> they're cleaning That's house. That's right. They're using us to virtualize that and to make it look like one filer again. And so we got overwhelming requests for that, which forced us, we changed our roadmap. We produced our 2.0 release just two weeks ago right. um, to help solve this clutter problem. Clean up. So let's talk about that, because that, that to me is the, uh, what is what's the, f the phenomenon of, of an entrepreneurship startup model. You're in the market, you're doing business, and some entrepreneurs make the mistake of kind of, you know, either not, or staying too academic and not going and getting into the market. This is a case where you guys have a market position, you have some tech, you're talking to customers and you're in the middle, and a good thing just happens, the world spins on your doorstep. Right. Is that kind of what you're saying that happened here? It's like you were in the middle, you recognize it, someone probably did it in one off and, and said, hey, let's do this, and said, hey, wow. Everyone right. likes yeah, we this. Had not, we, had not, we had not really thought, I mean, in terms of our roadmap, we had other things on there, we had not really thought of it until customers, it, was like, it, was, it wasn't just one, it was you know, one after Lots. another after another. So talk, walk me through the decision. I mean, you're the CEO, people have wacky ideas all the time. Hey, Ron, we got to be doing this. And, you know, <laughs> the engineer, hey, I got a product guy's doing this, sales guys are demanding this. You know, when do you go, how do you get this done? I mean, how do you go, wow, that's, it makes sense, not a lot of cost, so take us through that thought process. So Rebecca's probably the biggest driver here on gathering information and statistics and input and making everything very methodical. So we, very, we clearly have a CRM, we track all of our customer requests, and we, it allows us to view in some very simple dashboards exactly what people want and what they're waiting for. You're right, there's always one-off customers that's going to want everything, and if you listen to all the noise, you're just going to listen to whoever's the loudest. And that's not the important way to go. Yeah, yeah. The important way to go is to gather, right. you know, figure out where the bulk of your customers want you to go. And then go you've got to add a little bit of art, direction. though, too, in terms of what's going on in the market, the broader market. That's yeah. the part that's, that's right. a little scarier. That's right. Yeah, because you've you got to make it. It's a risk management decision. Sure. Like you, because you're, you know, you pivot to this direction. It's resources. It's you know, right. it's risky, right? right? So you got to figure out. You know, so what, will you, it work? Right. Yeah. And so you know, the, always the fear is. Let's say you have a hundred customers and they want this one thing, but what if those customers are very unique and that's it? You know, they are they are unique, and no other customers are like them. Yeah. So, yeah. so we have some other checks to make sure that you know. Um, but global we're namespace was an was an upswell. It was yeah. a lot of our customer base, a lot of the install base, and then lots of potential. We do customers. a lot. We do a lot right. of them. That's one. We're um, first of all, that's exciting because we're advocates of this model. Uh, we use social media, whether it's video or blogging, and we gather data. That's where that's, that's our great. that's our core it's all business. About the data. Because it is about the signal from the noise, and it's kind of like that movie Contact with Jodie F uh, Foster. You know that little sound that they hear uh -huh. in the white space opens up to a massive amounts of of good data. Right. So, you know, this social media has been great for us and, and if you look for the right data, you can get you can spot that stuff. So, you know, a lot of companies miss this because they just don't they're not disciplined or the VC say, you know, you said you were gonna do X. You know, I've seen that happen all the time where the VCs actually would say, No, you committed in the plan to do this. So you probably had to go in and say, hey we're gonna make a little direction change um, based on the data. That's right. And they go, okay, mm -hmm. makes sense. And it's obvious, if you have the data, it's an easy decision. What's the pricing, what's the uptake, right. That's if right. it's a forecast, now you're rolling, global namespaces, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. That's right. Especially with this marketplace now that we're in with a lot of the diversity. And what you find is um, people build clutter. They gather clutter. You know, the, the hot filer one time is not the hot filer now. And even if they stay single vendor, there's yeah. older filers and newer filers, and they want to hide that. What the, the big thing on the global namespace piece is they talk about data center administrators. Well, the data center admin doesn't actually administer the data center. He's the admin, he's administering the users because any change he makes in the data center has to go tell every user about. And he, it's, it becomes this big logistics issue. So we could hide all that. The user see one filer from now on and he could do anything he wants in the data center and stays hidden. But it really was this upswell of requests and demand for it. That's great, that's great. So let's talk about um, what's next for you guys. Obviously, uh, you're going to roll out global namespace. What's on the roadmap beyond that? Well, you know, obviously you're here at the show. Um, is it, uh, I mean, when I say what's next, I mean, like from a product, you know, trend data perspective, you're looking at a lot of data. Is it virtualization? Is it, obviously, that's a key driver, you mentioned that. Um, what are the key forces and directions that you guys are going to take? Well, I think more, so, cloud is the big buzzword. And I think what cloud means to us is both private and public. What it means to us is people are looking for a centralized place to put their data, and then they want to let users access it. And whether the storage is centralized or not, users want ubiquitous access to it. So no matter where they are, no matter what their proximity is to the data. From multiple platforms like, too. That's right, multiple platforms, multiple sites, 
multiple user locations, they want to see the same image of their data. So data interoperability that's is right. kind of what you're saying. That's right. That's, that's the, the big, big push for us right now. What do you think of big data? What's your definition of big data? That's the trend that's everywhere, everyone's talking about. We cover it. Um, uh, it's hot from Hadoop to you know Oracle. So it's funny. Um, I don't know that I can classify our customers as to one type. We have some customers where it's large files, large databases, lots of access. Like the movie that. guys. That's right. Then we have other people where it's tiny, lots of tiny files. Everyone's doing their own thing, and there are all these updates going on, and there's a lot of sharing going on, right? More like the social media guys. Yeah. And so to us, you know, right, to us, big data is every type of data. But what the big commonality is, people want the same access to it wherever they are. Right. And it's you know it's, it's all different styles, different models of data, but always being able to see the yeah. same image. I'm Mike Olson, the, the founder, uh, the CEO of Cloudera, and you know, I talk about this all the time. He actually hates the word big data. Huh. This is it's very much uh, you know, data doesn't get smaller. I mean, right. you can it's always. Right. I mean, right. I mean you can compress, but ultimately, right. <laughs> more data is created every day. More and more so, and more, right? so it's getting bigger. Yeah, so it should be definitely. called bigger data. Um, but he doesn't like it because he's to that point. See, you know, even with cloud air, they see, you know, even Hadoop clusters. It's not about the size of the cluster; it's about the, how many clusters they have. Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of different formations of, of what they, what's looking at. So, so he he hates the word big data. And I agree with him. I think it's about data, period, and data as an asset into developers, into other platforms. So this data interoperability is an interesting kind of dynamic because if someone creates data from say a, a user on a mobile phone, right. that might be accessed by another system and another filer. So who gets what data? So that's interesting, do you get a copy of the data? So this is an interesting phenomenon. Cool, okay, we're here in theCUBE, thanks for coming in. We appreciate it, Ron, thanks. Rebecca, thanks a lot. Very good, thank you. Good luck you. with your business, congratulations. We're here inside theCUBE talking, talking to startups. SNW is the largest tech show in storage. It's changing, it's becoming mainstream, mega growth. These guys are going to make a lot of money. Avir is a great company, well backed, successful entrepreneurs, doing it again uh, with his team. Congratulations. Uh, the big guys are changing to solid state, a lot of new opportunities. Thanks so much for coming in theCUBE. Thanks great. again. Thank you. Okay.